Hey everybody, and welcome once again to Paragon 2019. We're so excited to have you here today. We're sharing some amazing stories about high performing marketers who are going through transformation and they're getting great results. Who knew it happens to be one of those companies, a really innovative companies that helps educational leaders make more informed and impactful decisions. And I've got three very special guests on the phone with me today. First of all, I'm joined by Andrea Gronberg, the VP of Marketing from Who Knew It. Thanks so much for being here today, Andrea. Thanks for having us. I've uh, also got Megan Sutherland, uh, Marketing Campaign Specialist at Who Knew It. Thanks for being here, Megan. Of course. Thank you. So I've also got Alana Rodas uh, from the Customer Success Team over at PFL. Thanks for being here today, Alana. Great. Thanks for having me. All righty. So, uh, Andrea, I'm wondering, maybe just to kind of get the ball rolling here, if you could just give us a bit more background uh, about who knew it and what it is that you all do. Absolutely. And again, thanks for having us. Um, we're, we're always thrilled to uh, talk about our, our um, relationship with account-based marketing and our partnership with PFL, um, as they've been such great partners for us and love sharing ideas with other marketers. So, um, maybe just to set the context. Um, so, we... The solution we provide um, is a, a data analytics solution to K-12 education. So our addressable market is, is pretty well known, right? There are kind of 16,000 school districts across the country in the U.S. Um, and really from a, a sales and marketing perspective, we were, we were sort of treating them all, all equally. Um, so I've been with Who Knew It for about two and a half years. Um, really establishing the, the marketing organization here, um, but have been in um, education, technology, software marketing um, for about the past 10 years. Um, so we really were looking at ways um, to you know, establish marketing um, within this organization. Um, we play in a space that um, doesn't have a ton of, of providers like us that are providing a solution like us, but there's a lot of education technology companies that are going after the same audience members. So it's less of a direct competition, but a competition for brain space. Um, so when we sort of established the marketing program, we leaned a lot on digital marketing tactics. So um, invested heavily in a new website, um, kind of end of 2017 into 2018, um, we were spending a lot of money on um, kind of digital marketing campaigns, um, lots of, of sort of Google AdWords, SEO, SEM, um, building a huge content library of uh, marketing content to really pull folks inbound. Um, and we were building kind of robust nurture tracks um, and then just starting to dabble in in intent data, um, but it was all kind of overwhelming for us. We're um, a small marketing organization at that point in time. We had about four marketers. Um, now we're going into 2020 um, with six, six marketers, um, but still we need to make sure that we're, you know, prioritizing both our tactics as well as um, our target list. Wow. Okay. So when you came on board, it sounds to me like it was a very transitional time. There was lots going on in a small team. And uh, I think that a lot of, you know, marketing teams can relate to that exact situation. Um, if you, when you first came on board and building out that process, I mean, it, because who knew it's been around for a while, there must have been some existing processes in place. Um, would you say that historically it was very traditional marketing that was going on um, pr before you came on board? So there wasn't a, a lot of marketing. Um, it was a lot of, I would say, marketing tactics that the sales team was conducting. So, gotcha. um, you know, going to trade shows, um, you know, just a lot of sort of direct selling. Okay. Um, so kind of pairing that with uh, digital tactics. Um, but I would say the sales and marketing teams were still fairly siloed, right? There okay. was direct selling going on here lots of digital tactics going on the other side and we were kind of kicking leads back and forth. Um, and the, 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 the challenge and the sort of need for transition wasn't really apparent in the results. Right. Um, so, you know, as I looked at it, we were hitting our conversion rates 
from a digital perspective, our lead gen volume looked really good Mm -hmm. where the breakdown happened was within the conversion rate. And that right now is still a share goal within the sales and marketing organization. Um, But what I was starting to see on the marketing side was a lot of our lead gen was, you know, non-decision makers where whether from a sales or a marketing perspective, we were just um, needing to work with a lot of influencers, getting a lot of referrals and just spending a lot of time in that kind of pre-qualification process that mostly led to a dead end. Right. And from a sales perspective, you know, they're, you know, they felt like what we were delivering wasn't of, of quality or it was taking them too long to get to the decision maker. Okay. So the decision was made that there, there needed to be, you know, the silos needed to come down mm-hmm. and there needed to be better alignment kind of on the sales and marketing teams working together as one. Is that, was that kind of happening at the same time as the decision to move into more of an account-based marketing approach? Did you kind of build a team around, you know, building a new process out or was that something that the marketing department took on primarily by, its, by itself? So a little bit of both. We didn't necessarily um, kind of intentionally shift to account-based marketing. Um, in 2018, as we, as I sort of looked at those, those um, kind of end of probably Q2 results, right? So on paper, we looked good and it was, yeah. it was a big sell to the leadership team. We had some discussions with our board of directors, um, you know, why the shift when we're seeing the results that you told us that you were going, going to get. Sure. Um, naturally, because we work in K-12 education, Q3 is kind of a natural slowdown planning time for us. Obviously, teachers, principals, administrators are, you know, out during the summer. A lot of the decision makers that we try to market to are taking vacation in July. So it's a natural time for us to kind of slow down, reassess, and really build back up for the fall months in Q4, which is where we have a lot of our big pipeline generation happening. Um, School districts are typically doing their strategic planning at that time and kind of preparing their wish lists and, and budgets that typically go to boards in, in January or February. So kind of the October, November timeframe and end of January, February are a big um, opportunity creation and kind of meeting booking times. Sure. Um, so we knew if we wanted to capitalize that, uh, you know, end of 2018 into 2019, we really had to shift, shift efforts. So um really what we did is strip things down to the basics. So we stopped a lot of, of the programs that we were running um, and kind of took a step back, sat down with our sales team. Um, We do have um, the wonderful um, kind of structure in place where we have about just as many marketers as we do sales teams. I know some companies don't have that luxury. Their their marketing teams are significantly smaller, but we have the the, um, luxury of kind of having that Um, one-to-one. So we sat down with each of our reps um, and walked through kind of each of their target accounts in each of their territories. So it was a long process, um, but I will say it paid off tenfold. So, I mean, we looked really granular at, you know, where we have reference accounts, where our competition was already embedded, where we had personal relationships and really starting to group those into sub segment, which later became kind of how we organize our, campaigns so that we could be hyper personalized that is incredible okay so i've never like i guess you had an opportunity to to take an approach that led to that level of granularity on the account i can't imagine the insights that you're able to just you know derive from that type of process uh, and the information and kind of data that you're able Mm -hmm. to, to gather around at the individual account level um so it sounds to me like it happened kind of organically uh, but one thing you, you said a few minutes ago is just that uh, it seemed like the senior leadership was already kind of happy with the marketing function. Their kind of perception of marketing was was already pretty good. But you knew deep down that there was, I guess, room for improvement here and an opportunity to try something a little bit different. Yep, absolutely. We, I felt like we a lot of the metrics that we had in place and the tactics that we were deploying we're looking at an individual, right? So we had a digital marketing approach. We had designed a lead scoring model, but so many of the tactics were driven toward the individual and not the account. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, an individual would pass our, our um, lead scoring threshold, 
we'd kick it over to the sales team and a lot of times they would they would kick it back so we had this right. great feedback loop um, and all this data to, to kind of reassess so what you know what we did in that kind of su those summer months was take a step back um, and look at the way we want to restructure our campaigns with all of this new information that we have you know uncovered with our sales team within our target account so sure. an old campaign might have looked like kind of a generic blast whether that was through you know a retargeted ad or an email to tech leaders you know nationwide across whoever we had in the database that was yeah. a tech leader um, maybe we would segment that down and do different messages for states but there really wasn't a lot of granularity involved um, and then what we wanted kind of the new approach to look like is um, to look at campaigns from an account perspective. So, you know, kind of fast forward to last year, end of Q3, Q4, a campaign would look like targeting six accounts in Southern California, as an example, and deploying tactics across what we call kind of a five by five. So we take five kind of key leaders, decision makers that we want to try to book a meeting with yeah. um, across an account and deliver a really personalized message for them. And then what we're tracking is engagement at the overall account level. So, you know, in, in our old world, we would have looked at that just from an individual contact perspective. Now sure. we're requiring engagement across that leadership organization. And then we're not actually kicking it over to the sales team until we have a um, committed meeting, whether that, that could be a virtual discovery call, a coffee meeting at an indiv uh, industry conference, or an on-site meeting within their district. So okay. we're really looking at that authority and need, kind of pre-qualifying that authority and need commitment to a meeting, um, and then kind of behind the scenes establish a service level agreement with our sales partners. Um, and we have a fabulous sales leader, um, Ed Garnett, on, um, on the sales organization within Who Knew It, um, who really drives that home with his team. That's incredible. Okay. So it must take a certain amount of discipline, I guess, to just kind of stick to those target accounts and those objectives. There's, a, I think, a tendency for a lot of marketers to shift back to more of a spray and pray, mm -hmm. right? And hope you get those meetings booked. But um, it's that's awesome that you've got such alignment and someone who's really you know bought in on the sales side as well who's a great leader that can help move that agenda forward so um i mean that's that's all amazing background andrea i think that's just super super helpful um when you kind of started trying to reach out to these accounts and to get these meetings booked were there any specific kind of tactics that were helping you, you know, book those important meetings with decision makers, those key decision makers? Yeah, and I'm, I'm actually going to pass this off to Megan. Um, I'd okay. love for her to share sort of how we landed on, on direct mail. Um, it wasn't necessarily, if I joke with my team all the time, if you would have told me that direct mail would be part of our, our marketing <laughs> plan um, 10 years ago, I would have told you you were crazy. Um, <laughs> but it's really been an effective um, first start to, to some robust plays. So yeah, okay. um, That's pretty, I can yeah. maybe, share, maybe share a little bit about um, kind of how we, how we landed on direct mail being part of ABM. Yeah, and like Andrea said, it was definitely not something that we um, were thinking about until we really started just throwing the idea out there and ideating a little bit. Um, I do have to give kudos to our colleague Mandy for coming up with our first direct mail piece. Um, but, you know, we were able to really hone in on those targets that Andrea was talking about on a, a regional basis um, based on the, the target states that we wanted. Um, from there, drilling down into their, those personas and then figuring out what kind of thing would they really like to receive in the mail. So um, I, uh, coming up with different ideas, the idea we landed on was a box of fortune cookies. Um, and the fortune cookies had a little note inside that talked a little bit about data um, or this isn't just a fortune. It's uh, really about your data, that kind of messaging. Um, the messaging oh, that's so great. Anyway. I love that. Yeah. That's yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that creative process, Megan, because I, I feel like 
coming up with good ideas. There's, there's such an opportunity with direct mail. It sounds like you went right out of the gates and used dimensional mail, you know, something that actually mm-hmm. people can receive in a package. Was the, what was the kind of thought process behind that as opposed to reaching out with, you know, some other form of direct mail? Yeah, so a couple things to touch on. Um, we wanted to make sure that it didn't look super marketing focused. So we didn't have any branding on the outside of the piece. We wanted to um, make it pretty, uh, pretty blank and all of that. Um, you know, we throw out the ideas of things like white papers or different um, sheets like that. But I think landing on the, the actual physical treat um, was something that, um, felt just kind of a little stickier. So it felt unique in, um, in the space where people may be getting direct mailers all the time, um, different pieces of, of collateral or papers, um, in their mailbox. And it just is something that physically stands out a little bit more. Um, you know, it's got a little bit of dimension to it. It was a little, um, USPS box. Um, and the the messaging itself and the, the, um, the cookie, the message inside, and then the handwritten personalized note all just made sense, um, to really get granular to that specific persona that we were going after. Do you, do you remember any of those initial reactions from people who received the (laughs) fortune cookie? What, What were, uh, what were those like? They were a lot were, you know, that's an, really crazy idea. Great, great idea. Um, you know, so things that were kind of a little more in shock, like, um, didn't expect to get fortune cookies, but I shared them with my team. And so, um, the shareable aspect of it too was something that was kind of fun and exciting for us. Um, because we wanted to make sure that the entire team of the, the person that we sent it to was able to to get that as well and get the message and um, be that advocate too for, for the product. Yeah. I mean, that's such a great idea. So in terms of executing on it, um, did you, how did you actually like, were you assembling boxes yourself or how, like <laughs> the team? Like how did, what did that process look like? Yeah. I have to find a picture. <laughs> so, Megan. <I'm> just... <laughs> I know it feels like we call it way back in the day of assembling the cookie boxes. So um, I mean, we had, boxes that we had to tape together. We had, a, we have a small er office, I guess you could say it holds about five people. So we had boxes of fortune cookies in the office and packs of boxes and tape. And we were ordering all these supplies and it was felt kind of crazy at the time. And then, um, yeah, packaging eight fortune cookies in a box, taping a label on it, taping it shut, handwriting the cards. Wow. Um, so we were all kind of in it together and all doing all of the different aspects of this assembly line. Um, I think we all ended up having a favorite part of the assembly line too. So that was kind of um, fun. Our colleague, Nick, he's the professional box maker and I love taping the labels on and nice. Andy likes putting the cookies in. So we all had a, um, a piece to the, to the process. So that's um, awesome. Yeah, it was pretty fun. At any True point, dedication. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds like it. <laughs> I'm wondering if at any point in time you opened up a fortune cookie that said this campaign will be a success. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's, that's amazing, but obviously not scalable, right? I, I mm-hmm. should probably wear a few hats right now. And um, although really fun to assemble the fortune cookie boxes, uh, you probably at some point thought, you know, maybe there's a better way to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, what, when was that kind of point that you decided you needed to, to kind of ramp up direct mail efforts? Yeah, so it was probably towards the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, when we realized we wanted to scale. Um, so our target account list was larger than we um, could handle, and it was growing a bit. And um, yeah, we only had certain amount of hands in the room to, to help out. And we were kind of maxing out um, what we could do in a given week, a given month, um, mm-hmm. based on the, the quantity that we really wanted to get out there. Um, like Andrea mentioned, you know, the five by five grid that we um, focused on, you know, that included 
tech leaders, uh, curriculum leaders, research leaders. So being able to target each of those contacts with one specific piece then does multiply it um, that much more. So um, it was probably around the end of last year, beginning of this year, where we realized we needed a little, uh, a few more hands. <laughs> okay. So uh, in that process, did you immediately look for um, a technology partner? Like what what, what exactly were you looking for at that stage and someone to help you with uh, ramping up direct mail? Yeah, so a few areas that were pretty important to us were um, a company that uh, integrated into Salesforce. That was a huge um, area. And then um, just a, a company that would help us scale in creating these kits, these campaigns, but also still having that personalization aspect of it that was really important to us. The handwritten note was very important and making sure that the, the note was tailored to each of the different personas that we were targeting. Um, those were kind of the, the key aspects when we were looking for a partner to help us scale. And that, that's, such a, that's such a great point, Megan, because I think the personalization aspect for me at least is what pushes that program over the edge. I mean, it really feels like you're getting something special in the mail. And I don't get a lot of mail these days unless it's, you know, an envelope. So to have something that's three dimensional, that's got that handwritten aspect, um, I can see why, you know, those, those target accounts were engaging. I mean, that's just so, so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so why was it that you kind of landed on PFL? Was there, you know, one thing or was it the sum of the whole uh, that kind of pushed you in that the direction to move forward with PFL. Yeah, so they had everything we were looking for that I had just mentioned, but I think the the key piece that really stood out to us and that attracted us to PFL the most was that um, they were willing to partner with us and bring ideas to the table. So we came up with this, um, you know, great idea of the fortune cookie box and all of that, um, but PFL had to offer us a lot of different ideas and we're able to um, bring those to us. We would kind of come up with this strategy and then we have, um, they offer the, the meeting of being able to kind of come up with and I uh, bring ideas to the table. So that was something that really we liked um, a lot about PFL. And I think actually, Megan, that's a perfect segue to kind of pull Alana back into the, the conversation here. Um, and Elena, I guess my question to you is, you know, do you find that a lot of customers that come to PFL share a similar story where they, you know, dip their toe in the water and realize they need to, to grow? Yes, absolutely. Um, either it's we've tried it and we need to scale, um, but at the same time, it could be we actually haven't done direct mail. We hear that it's something that can really make an impact and we want to try it. Or it can be, we have tried it and I don't feel like we're doing it absolutely right. So please come help us. So, so it's a mix, but really um, when I hear um, Megan and Andrea talk about how we were able to scale and just continue to show return on the investment, um, we hear that a lot as well. Um, you know, direct mail helps cut through the clutter and then create that moment. And that's just something that email can't do. So um, absolutely. I would say too that Megan and I talk a lot about trial and error, you know, so regardless of where you're starting, um, you may need to try more of an ABM type approach, change up your call to action, whatever it is. It's about figuring out what works and then putting fuel on the fire um, and then scale, scaling it with us too. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because there are so many, you know, there are so many entry points for direct mail. People have used it in the past and kind of want to try it again, but don't have the experience or expertise that they need. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's amazing that you do have different customers coming in, you know, with different stories for sure. Okay. Um, so in terms of, you know, when a new customer comes to PFL, can they, can they really lean on the team over there for that expertise and coaching? Is that, yeah. is that, is that part of yeah. the learning process? Absolutely. Um, and actually, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I did want to touch just on the support team that you get when you join PFL and through onboarding. 
Um, you know, we have the customer success manager that's really focused on metrics and making sure that you're seeing a return. We also have our solutions architects that really step in on the technology side of it. You know, so you may be um, an organization that's starting at Batch and Blast, um, but PFL allows you to also send a package based on a level of engagement too. And that's got to be set up a little bit differently from a technical perspective. So we have solutions architects to help with that. Even in onboarding, we have onboarding project managers that simply focus on pushing deadlines and driving towards a go-live date, which is great when you're first working on a, you know, a new program and you may not be focused on that, so it's really great to have that person. And then lastly, we have a customer success associate team that really manages the day-to-day -day of the program from a production standpoint. So, you know, we're vert vertically integrated. So our facility in Montana is producing uh, really every part of the kit that you're seeing. Um, and we've got a team dedicated just to make sure that that production is going well. So there's no doubt that you've got the support you need to make it happen. And it's just about getting it done. So wow. we're there to help. That is amazing. You know, like I'm a bit of a tech junkie. So I, I usually I've used like tons of different platforms. I've never heard a, you know, a support team like that where there are multi years yeah. with different objectives. Yeah. So uh, that that's just that's absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, I, I guess maybe um, either Andrea or Megan, um, wondering about your experience, you know, the onboarding uh process was do you remember anything about it i know it's happened a little while ago but uh, does anything kind of jump out at you yeah i think just have again having those uh different team members um working with us we were able to do a lot simultaneously which i think a lot of um just technology platform whether a technology platform or not um sometimes it's more sequential where i felt like we were able to get done i think we launched a campaign within like two and a half weeks of okay. implementation so oh, wow. While the tech team worked with our Salesforce systems administrator, we were able to actually develop the play. Um, so those things happen very, very quickly. So, um, and Megan can kind of speak to the, um, the kind of cadence and the collaboration um, since then. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, it's been such a good experience. I have complete and total trust in their entire team. Um, they have been super collaborative, you know, bringing ideas to the table all the way to something's not going perfectly right or they see a glitch in the system and we hop on a quick call and get it taken care of that day. So, um, and Alana and I have weekly phone calls and we touch on everything from prior campaigns, how to optimize them, how to um, iterate on the wording, like she said, trial and error, um, all the way into new campaigns and what can we do to tap into a new market or a new persona. Um, so it's extremely collaborative and um, the relationship is, is kind of blown us away with, with how good it is and um, how successful we've been. That's amazing, yeah. Megan. That sounds like a 10 out of 10 to me. So yeah. uh, awesome. I was going to say best part of my Friday is talking. I know, <laughs> I know. It's a Friday morning phone call. I look yep. forward to it. And we have Same. Time. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, so, I think the results really feel shared together. Mm -hmm. uh, we've reflected internally just as a team, you know, if we would have gone this other direction, like where would we be right now? Um, and some of that is just probably more work on, on our end, but it really feels like you know, we're looking at those um, response rates together. We're getting advice um, on, although we don't necessarily collaborate with other PFL customers, we feel really confident that, you know, when we're, when we're interacting that you guys are giving us um, kind of follow-up or calling cadence best practices um, that you've seen success with and also sharing other tactics. I know there was one, I can't remember what campaign it was, that you brought to us, hey, I just had somebody, a manufacturing customer use this tactic. Um, so again, it's, you know, it's not, not necessarily uh, in education going to the same audience, um, but it's a tactic that you've seen success with um, and have brought that to our attention. So it's, it's just yeah. been a very, very great process. That's awesome. Yeah, we're definitely a huddle type of organization. So we have CSM huddles where we talk about, you know, what works for other customers and so forth. And it's great to have that top of mind and then share share with your team as well and see if it works or not. But um, I love that part of it too. Um, 
Yeah, no kidding. We, as marketers, we have to kind of, you know, teach each other and Mm -hmm. uh, just being able to pass on that knowledge is pretty powerful. So um, Alana, I'm going to ask you one question that, you know, I I need to know because we're interested in experimenting with direct mail ourselves. Nice. Um, as a new customer, you know, what, what would I need to do if, you know, I landed in your hands on the customer success team to feel prepared for that, you know, initial kickoff call? Mm-hmm. It, yep. Can, I, can yep. I go in without like anything cold here and you'll work <laughs> through it with me or should, you know, is there, you know, something structured that I should have ready uh, on day one? So we absolutely will um, work with you if you don't have any thoughts or um, about, you know, where you're going to go with um, the program. But I will say it is super helpful to have an understanding. And actually, we've talked about our account executives um, on the front end to bring this up sooner in our sales process, too, so our customers are more prepared. But, um, you know, what's the primary use case? Where do you see specifically implementing a first program? And, you know, sometimes that could be just where you need the most help in your funnel, or that can be based on an event um, that is more time specific. So if you're able to think about uh, the use case, um, think about a messaging that you believe that you would use for that use case. And I bring that up because the messaging and how it ties to the item is super important. And that's really to what Megan said about us bringing ideas to the table. That's where when we're able to be creative from taking some messaging and then producing an, an item that we think would go really well with that. And then lastly would be your KPIs. How do you want to measure the program? How is it going to be a success to you? Just so that we're driving towards that from the very beginning. um, And that's top of mind. So really, you don't have to have all those answered. But if you've given some thought, then you'll feel a lot more prepared for what I'm going to ask you because I'm going to ask you about it. So, <laughs> Perfect. No, that's good to know. So I'll, uh, that'll give me something to think about uh, later on tonight for sure. But I love it. <laughs> one thing, uh, Alana, that you mentioned that kind of jumps out is KPIs, right? And uh, maybe just switching this back to the, the Who Knew It team, um, you know, what, what kind of KPIs do you have in place to kind of measure your success? I imagine DNA's, you know, or your like measurement is in your DNA. So mm-hmm. um, I, I'm sure there's probably a pretty structured approach there. Um, what is it, you know, that, that you're using to measure the success of these uh, programs? Yep. So we, we still look at the marketing funnel very closely. So we want to see where everything's staged, but we're looking at that at, at account uh, level versus an individual Um, And then kind of the KPIs that we're all responsible for, we're looking at that meeting rate, um, which I think would maybe translate to response rate um, of how some other organizations um, capture that. We're looking at of the meetings that we've generated for the sales team, we want to see 50% of those moving into a sales qualified stage. Um, And then we also measure our pipeline ads. So once they're once they're qualified, how much um, how much pipeline is that really generating? Um, and then we're always looking for a four x pipeline for um, from our sales quota numbers. Wow. Um, so those are sort of the I guess the the three areas that we're constantly in tune with. We look at that overall, but then we also look at that on an, a campaign by campaign um, level. Okay. Wow. So, so I, just I, oh. oh sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, just to give some context, so that meeting rate, which is, I think, really a, a testament to the quality of the campaign, when we were doing it ourselves and the assembly line that Megan was <laughs> describing, we had, I think, just over a 3% response rate, which maybe sounds low, but we were, I mean, that is astronomical compared to what we were doing with some of our digital, um, sure. digital tactics, where we were yielding, you know, less than 1% because we were doing these you know, really large kind of broad brushstrokes of marketing tactics um, and not doing a ton of segmentation. Um, Now, and I think some of this is, um, you know, we are a little worried about scaling, right? So, okay, if you go from, you know, putting 100 kits together a month to, you know, um, bumping that up to several hundred, is our quality going to come down? Um, and we've seen just the opposite. So I think I just closed the books for Q, the end of Q3. So year to date, we're north of 10% of wow. our meeting rate, um, which is far exceeding any of our expectations. 
um, we're sitting just above a 50% um, conversion rate. So of the meetings we've been able to book through these ABM campaigns, half of those are going into sales qualified. Um, um, and we've added over $12 million in, in pipeline um, for our sales team, which is more than they've ever seen. That <laughs> so. is unbelievable. That's Congratulations amazing. on Thank all the success. Like that just must feel so good. <laughs> Um, so I, I would assume with all these things happening, and I think you mentioned, Andrea, that the team has started to grow, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, do you feel like PFL has had, uh, like a hand in helping the team, you know, grow? Is that something that because of their direction, uh, and just your leadership and everything that Megan's doing on the campaign side, it just makes for a natural fit to have a, a bit of a bigger team? Yeah, I think, I mean, they've certainly been uh, a core. I think the biggest thing is, you know, again, I'm going back to the, the assembly line process that Megan was, uh, you know, we knew we needed to change. We knew we needed to test this out, which is why we all kind of jumped in and sort of all hands on deck proved this concept out. Mm -hmm. What now we've been able to do is take that process, give it to a vendor that really knows it well, can optimize it. And now our team spends, you know, probably 50, 50 on really digging in and make sure we have the best list possible and the right message and continuing to personalize that message. Um, and next year we don't have any kind of grandiose, um, um, changes to that. It's, you know, spending more time perfecting that and, and doing each of those pieces better. Okay. Let's talk about those, those people who are really conflicted, right? They're used to spending a certain amount of dollars within their marketing budget on more, you know, traditional spray and pray type approaches, I guess mm -hmm. you could call them. Um, and don't really have the confidence to take more of a, a, like a target account type approach, maybe have fewer, but more focus. Do you have any kind of advice for those people who are thinking about dipping their toe in that water? Oh, absolutely. John, I, I think, Number one, it starts before you even think about marketing tactics, it starts with really tight alignment with the sales organization. So I like to say we're, we're hip to hip with our, with our sales organization um, so that we're really on the same page, um, not just with the messaging, but with the, the targets that we're going after. So um, just to give you um, an example, so we meet with formally with each of our reps on a biweekly basis. Um, this is kind of a more formal meeting where we talk about recent activity, what was successful, why wasn't it su successful. We'll get direct feedback on the meetings they had, good or bad, so that we can incorporate that in, back into our process. Yeah. Um, we dig into target lists for future plays, and then we brainstorm campaign ideas with them. So um, just establishing kind of that cadence. Um, and then we don't wait for the next meeting. So we're always, you know... Uh, soliciting feedback they're sharing feedback on marketing campaigns it happens very fluidly um we're you know emailing messaging ideas back and forth um so it's it's been very collaborative and wow. um you know we have a wonderful sales leader in place that helps foster that but the reps have really bought in you know once they start to see meetings pop up on their <laughs> calendar that are that are you know really great decision makers they want more of it so um right. so they're they're definitely in that oh that's so cool like uh, it almost sounds i mean the communication in that case is like mm -hmm. off the charts that you know there are very few organizations who are able to have that level of collaboration so uh, but it sounds like it's time well spent you know mm -hmm. and uh certainly you're getting some amazing results andrea so um that's that's really cool what about direct mail you know is um for those who are just thinking about experimenting, is it a matter of just going for it? Or um, what, what type of advice do you have for those people who are thinking about maybe, you know, trying, trying at least direct mail? Yeah, I think, um, again, taking a step back and just being creative and taking some risks. I think um, you can start small. So, um, you know, we, the, we didn't go out with hundreds of contacts right away. Um, right. We started with a small pocket, actually, I think in, in Southern California, um, where we had some some awareness um, and a lot of our that success we've actually continued. And so even though we might deploy hundreds of campaigns um, each month, the actual sends are still, you know, sometimes seven, sometimes a dozen sure. accounts at a time. 
Um, so, so start small, don't shy away from, um, from the direct mail piece, especially the three dimensional. We do, we do some, some two dimensional things too, some, sometimes as follow-ups, yeah. um, and then pairing that with digital. So our, you know, our web content, our robust library of, of online content hasn't gone away. It's just supplemented kind of this, this core ABM approach. Um, so it's kind of marrying those two those two together. You can't just do direct mail and expect um, results. It's really um, kind of the combination of, of different types of ways to um, break through the noise. Yeah. And I think from Megan's point earlier, having that integration into, you know, systems like Salesforce, mm -hmm. this is, you know, that, that tie in, those integrations are so critical as well. So um, that's really helpful, Andrea. Thank you so much. And I guess, um, you know, how are your needs evolving? What do you, what do you kind of see um, that, that you'll be doing in 2020 to kind of continue down this path of greatness? Yeah, so we, um, we're in a kind of a unique situation right now. Um, we historically have sold mostly to large school districts. So in the U.S. market, think Chicago Public Schools, Albuquerque Public Schools, San Diego Unified is a, is a client of ours. So very large organizations um, and our fantastic product and engineering team is actually looking at our offering and making adjustments both into in terms of the infrastructure, so how they bring data into the system, and then visualizations and what smaller districts are going to need to make it more affordable and easier to implement. So from a marketing perspective, our addressable market um, is going to expand and we don't yeah. want to fall back into that cadence of, well, let's just treat all of our target accounts equally. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at ways both on the front end, um, things that we can add to our tech stack to help us um, bring in ju not just the insight that we have from a sales and marketing organization, but looking at things like intent data to help prioritize our list so we can you know, get the message in front of the right person at the right time when they're evaluating solutions. Sure. Um, and then obviously, PFL will, will continue to be core and, and direct mail will still continue to be core um, in that play. But the actual number of kits we produce next year versus this year might be the same. We just want the list to be smarter and, and we right. anticipate that that response rate to continue to go up. Um, and then kind of on the back end of the campaign, right now we're still, we're pushing out like follow-up email communications. We have an SDR resource that we use um, we're looking at doing some automation um, on the end of that, but again, still keeping that that direct mail piece really core. Wow! So some huge things ahead for next year, which is really exciting. That's awesome. Uh, thanks, Andrea. Um, Alana, I'm wondering maybe if you can kind of close us out before I officially close us out, uh, because I can't think of anyone who's better suited to talk about what's on the horizon. You know, for PFL and really what customers have to look forward to, you know, as they're moving into 2020. Yeah. So I would just say that we're growing too, and we're getting more and more capabilities as our customers do more and more. That's a good answer. I love it. <laughs> um, well, we'll certainly continue to follow your journey um, at PFL and who knew its journey as well. Uh, I can say that, you know, just anecdotally in conversations that I've had with so many of our members, it's almost like direct mail is the, the hot thing for 2020. <laughs> People are just excited about it and they're getting results. And so, um, you know, as, as things continue to kind of, you know, move forward in the, the use cases of direct mail and marketers having a chance to share stories about what's working, uh, I think there's some pretty amazing things ahead. So um, I just want to say thank you, you know, Megan and Andrea, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Uh, just really cool to hear your story. It sounds like you've gone through quite the transformation and it's just, it's amazing to see the results that you're getting. And uh, I'm sure you're, you've got some great things ahead into uh, to next year. So thanks for your time today. Thanks, John. We appreciate the opportunity. Alana, thank you too. I mean, so interesting to hear your perspective and uh, just, it seems like you've really got your finger on the pulse when it comes to this stuff. So <laughs> thanks for, uh, you know, taking time to, to share, you know, PFL's perspective on all this stuff, certainly a leader in the space and uh, just really excited to, to see what you all have in store for next year as well. Thanks so much, John. Love talking about who knew it too.
<laughs> Thanks everyone for dialing in today. Really appreciate your time and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now.